5-31-8B3, Roman, Roman numeral 6. Do you have a page number? Uh, yes, and that is in our electronic packet, page 61. Thank you. Uh, and again, it's Roman numeral six. Uh, notice that failure to comply with the administrative order shall result in immediate revocation of an STR operating permit and business license. And that's if they haven't uh, resolved the issue, if they haven't requested, um, uh, I guess it'd be something in front of the judge, requested some sort of a court action. They just ignore uh, the notice they're given. Uh, that results in an immediate revocation of the SDR operating permit. Now, if we go down to four, which is also the next numerical four, also on page 61, it says within five business days following the uh, receipt of administrative notice, which is what's addressed in, in six as well. Um, that there is an option to revoke the license or just do an inspection. So in six, it says it's automatically revoked. In four, it says it can trigger an inspection. And that's where I'm seeing the conflicting language. If I can give more specifics on where that is, I'm happy to do so. Uh, yes, please. Okay, so uh, again, I'm, I'm working out the electronic packet, so I'm not sure if my numbers align with uh, the paper that you guys have. It's actually page 10 uh, on the paper that we have. Ah, okay. Uh, and so Roman numeral six, uh, states that notice that failure to comply with administrative orders shall result in immediate revocation of SDR operating permit. Gotcha. But then the next two down is number four, which is a compliance inspection. So following the receipt of the administrative notice, uh, we can schedule an inspection. It would seem to me that language six would dictate they've just had their, um, they've had their license pulled if they haven't already reached out to us to, for that inspection to take place. Whereas four implies, well, they haven't reached out to us, but we can then schedule that inspection. I think as we talked before, I think under number six, um, the shale um, would be changed to may. line are you on under four and then in the the shall appears in six six under six Roman numeral six Roman numeral six jump in here and, yes. and walk you through this because the um, provisions that planning and zoning created are um, very detailed and as I went through and was reading this I was I was startled at how many levels of of inspections there are and how many levels of compliance. So they start with a notice of violation. And the first thing is that, that a, a property will receive a notice of violation uh, um, that they, they believe whoever has some kind of level of, of probable cause or some kind of reasonable suspicion to believe. And city attorney, before you continue, can you note these numbers as we go along? So that's B1, correct? Notice of violation is the component that you're describing now? Right, so okay. we're just at notice of violation. Sure. So a property could be notified that there was a violation. Sure. And let's say that they didn't have a, there was a complaint there wasn't a fire extinguisher in the property. Okay. So that, had, that was sent in and a notice of violation will be sent to the property owner. Then within, within the notice of violation, folks have to be told right up front, because they're required under due process, that if they don't respond, if they choose to ignore this, then their license will be revoked. But they, they get five days, uh, five business days to bring it in compliance. So it may take them a couple of days to go buy their uh, fire extinguisher. They have to notify the enforcement officer, I'm in compliance, come to an inspection to see that I'm in compliance at this point. Sure. If they don't take the, the administrative notice seriously, if they blow it off, at that point, they've already been notified, hey, if you blow this off, you will lose your, and it's three permits, operating permit, which has an initial inspection of the property, uh, your registration permit, and your business license. So they're required to have three different licenses, permits to do this. So if, if they blow off 
a, a notice letter, then there can be action immediately. Okay, and that's, I, I like that, that's great. I am reading it that if they blow it off, they've got the five days to make the correction or call in and say they need an extension or say they wanna take it to court. If they do none of those things after five days, it shall be revoked. And that's, that's correct? That, that's how I read the language as well. Very good, thank you. A member Wink, we've well, got a few more. Um, sorry, I'm. I know you had to switch documents. So, so. And I, no, yes, I. But I went to where Mr. Cuesta was, and now I'm. So I'm, I'm, I, I'm at what should be D D, but I, mm -hmm. I'm looking for the number section. And it's about fire extinguisher numbers. Um, Under which five thirty one? That's what I'm trying to four, find. Um, I, life and safety, right? Oh, I know, yeah. Uh, SDR operating requirements, I beg your pardon. So it's under 531.4. It's not fire extinguishers. So how is that number of two adults per bedroom decided? Or So my, my thought is that it... Not, I mean, it seems reasonable to me, but it seems that it might correlate to the size and type of structure, and maybe we don't have variants to the point I'm thinking that would make it different. Um, I know we don't want 15 people in, in a bedroom. Um, like, what if two adults and a baby or a child under 12? So that's why we went with the adults and not adults. persons. So, like, a, you know, a couple adults and, you know, a 12 year old kid that would still be okay by that. Good, thank you. Perfect. And then uh, one more. Go ahead. So, right under that, a couple lines, uh, D, F, in that same section. Um, so, I wondered if we should include the tiny home language. Many people, some people equate tiny homes to trailers, but they're an evolution of what trailers, trailer culture, trailer living used to be. Um, I wondered if we would benefit from naming that among that list of... Under our building code, a tiny home would be a, a recreational vehicle because uh -huh. it's on wheels. So. Okay, thank you. Keep going, Councilmember Wink, no one else has their light on, so let's just go through them. Thank you. Um, again, I, I don't know where this is, but uh, so th this is the fire extinguisher piece. So uh, in, in saying how many per floor do you all know where it is? I'm hoping it didn't change in the newer document, and I'm speaking about nothing. Is it under life safety? Um, I have 31 5E. Good, thank you very much. So here for sure, I'm wondering if the requirement of a number of extinguishers, one, should be dependent on the square footage, or two, should be dependent on what really exists on each floor. So I'm thinking of... I don't know, uh, do people only use halon extinguishers? So where oven and a lot of electrical things might exist. I'm thinking, is this enough? Do we know it's enough for every property out there operating an SDR? Sorry, Mayor, that's so, the best I could come up with. No, it's a good one. And it's possible that we could direct staff to ask the um, fire marshal to look at this particular one and tell us what would be the best. Um, and, and this is written as a minimum, so I think if we want to look, I think that's a great idea is to ask um, the fire marshal. Thank you. To, okay. Opinion. I have more later. Uh, no, go ahead. No um, else has light. Oh, Member Stone does. We'll let him interrupt here. <laughs> um, and actually, just uh, as a follow-on to... Uh, member Wink's question about occupancy um, numbers. Uh, we have a maximum of eight individuals in an STR. Um, and uh, I would actually like to have that be part, well, I guess I'm not making a recommendation. Um, was the fire marshal consulted on that piece? Would be the question. Um, I believe they got a, a copy of the draft regulations to review, but we did not receive comment. Okay, thank you. Member Cuesta. I think I'm down to uh, the tail end here. So the first one is regarding parking, and I can give you the coordinates. It's page 56, mm -hmm. it's 53, or excuse me, 51-3-D-I. Uh, 
All STRs shall provide one parking space per bedroom and STRs lacking a paved parking space, uh, such as a driveway garage, shall be limited to two on-street parking places. Uh, there's also a limit of two adults per bedroom. So if you don't, you, if you don't have off-street parking, you only get two. The STR gets two. Uh, you can only have two adults um, per room. So if you're dependent on that ST, or if you're dependent on the off-street parking, you get two. You need to have one per room. So you can only rent two bedrooms uh, if you don't have off-street parking. Mm -hmm. And it says you shall have one parking space per bedroom. Uh, and this is again page 56, 53, or excuse me, 51-3-D or dot I. So yeah, so one parking space per bedroom, say they have two spaces in their driveway or in the garage. Um, so then if they're renting out, say four rooms, they can have up to those two on-street parking spaces in addition to that. Sure, and let's say they're lacking any off-street parking. So all they can depend on is the two on the street. Mm -hmm. If they have to guarantee one per room, then they can only rent two of the bedrooms, correct? That'd be correct. Okay, very good. And then the second one, it, I'm not sure if we got clarity on this last time. So is the city council in a, or the city attorney I just discussed, somebody receives a notice of violation. They can correct it, uh, call the city out, they can ask for more time to complete it, or they can say, let's, let's take it to court. So somebody says, let's take it to court. That gets tied up in court, it's gonna take X amount of time, and that's their first violation. Um, but it is not automatically revoked because they didn't ignore it, they, you know, they, they took it to court. Uh, it happens again. They get another violation, we say, let's take it to the court. It, it runs its, its course uh, through court. Happens a third time, uh, and they say, another third violation, let's take it to court. It runs its course again. They get up to three before, I, I, I can't remember if it's may or shall, but after that third violation, the, the city may or shall revoke the license. Every, they can keep renting in the meantime or they cannot keep renting in the meantime because I think you can really drag out three violations throughout the court if you wanted to. And I think we've actually seen this with another case in town. Uh, I will rely a little bit on the city attorney, but I believe um, you're, I don't believe you have to get to court to get your three for revocation. Can we get, turn to the city attorney then to expedite this? I'm like you, I'm, I'm looking through it quickly to find the provision. There is a, uh, during the pendency of the case in municipal court, the sh city shall not be precluded from addressing the violations of this chapter or any other title of the Inglewood Municipal Code through administrative or civil action to bring the STR property into compliance with this chapter or the Inglewood Municipal Code or any other applicable law or regulation. The business license and operating license may be administratively revoked in compliance with this chapter in addition to criminal prosecution. Where we're at right now with the STR enforcement is we don't have that kind of language. So it just, however long it takes to get through court. But there's a couple of different places where it says just because you're in court doesn't mean we can't move forward administratively. Okay, thank you. Finished, Member Questo? Yes, thank you. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem and then Member Wink. <clears throat> Actually, just to follow up on the question that was asked by uh, member Quest uh, regarding the parking because I read it differently and so if, if there's only off-street parking the way that I read it you can still rent the entire house for more than two bedrooms you're just limited to two cars and so I guess that that's kind of like the vagueness of the way that it's written that it's just it, up to interpretation of the beholder I guess so what was the intention there if are we just stating that if you don't have any driveway or if you don't have a driveway or a garage and you're limited to just off-street parking, you're limited to just two cars? You're, yeah, so you would be limited to just two cars, but you could say the intent was that you could say carpool and have right. multiple families and three bedrooms and two cars. And that would still be you're still fitting in those two parking spaces. That, that was the intent. So I just understood that a little bit differently than member Cuesta, but I just wanted to make sure that we were on the same page there, or if we need to change the language a little bit in order to not make it vague or open it up to interpretation. Sure. Thank you. Member Wink. Thank you, Mayor. So in 5-31-4, um, section I, Mr. Cuesta was just there talking about parking. Um, 
the last st sentence. So it says, any advertisement or listing of the STR shall provide the number of parking spaces available for use by the renter. I'm suggesting maybe number of parking spaces and locations. Are, are you asking a question? Are you making a no. suggestion? Oh, uh, whatever I'm supposed to do. Well, so but I, I wonder I, if I, we should. Let me help you with what I think we're going to do. As soon as we get the questions answered, we, we can still ask, continue to ask. But what I'd like to do then is get to 531-2, um, or definitions was one. And if we need to make any changes there, then go to two, then go and just hear what our amendments are. I have one more question before back. that. Okay, pardon? I have one more question. That's great. I'm just trying to let you know One why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, 531 7, uh, somewhere in there about um, violation. So, someone violates uh, three times and um, the permitting is revoked, correct? Um, before they're able to reapply for a short term rental permit, following their 18 months, I think. Uh, do, sh is it necessary for us to require any kind of uh, demonstration of corrected action or, you know, in prison it would be some proof of rehabilitation or just some proof of something that shows that something's changed, yes, let's reissue license after these parties actually underwent three violations. Well, we can certainly make sure there are no existing violations on the property. And if one of those three strikes, I'm gonna say, was a violation, we will certainly check that that has been corrected before we reissue, so. And that's it? Yeah. Okay, thank you. <coughs> it, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be the same violation three times. It's three violations, that's right? Correct. Okay, just yeah. want to make sure. Um, Councilmember Stone. Uh, so, keeping in my trend tonight, I'm going to follow on to Member Wink's question there and ask: um, Is there any way to include a provision that would essentially identify an STR operator as a bad actor uh, who reaches a limit and can no longer apply for a license to operate an STR? So I'm thinking about the example that Member Cuesta gave of this this house where, you know, there was some pretty awful things going on. And if that happened three times. They're done. I mean, well, but then they can reapply in 18, in 18 months. months. Yeah. So my question is, is there a process that we could include in the code that would say, you're done. We're, we're not giving this individual STR permits anymore. If, if your license was revoked, we can have language that <clears throat> eliminates the 18 months and just, you know, they would be done. They, I'm not saying something. We have to make, I think we'd have to make an amendment to say that in the next round gotcha. here, okay? Uh, member Sierra, or Member Quest is next, and then Mayor Pro Tem. Okay, well, I, I like where uh, Member Stone is going with that. And I'd like to revisit the parking because I think we'll need to change the language one way or another. So just that I'm on the same page, too. I'm reading this all STRs shall provide one parking space per bedroom. So if you're renting four bedrooms, you need four spaces. And if you don't have off-street parking, you can't do it because you only get two on the street. Is that correct or no? I can see the confusion in the language, and we can definitely clarify that. Um, just, I mean, is... is Council wanting one parking space per bedroom, or do you want a yeah. set amount? Per and I guess we can have that conversation up here. I think parking is definitely something we need to keep in mind, but we can figure that out. Yeah. Thank you. Your pro time. Yeah. And this may be something that we may table for another time because it may be more process, but uh, I brought up the fact that Boston and Airbnb settled. Uh, Airbnb stated that, you know, without a license number, a valid license number from the city of Boston, if you don't have that within your posting, then those STRs get removed from Airbnb immediately. So I didn't see any language within um, CB4 regarding that. So I think that's more a process, but is that something that we're taking into account at some point? How to work with the third party providers on how exactly to license this and make it easy to remove any unwanted or unlicensed properties from Airbnb and any other third party sites? Let me jump in here, 5-31-7. 
subsection C5, upon revocation of any short-term rental business license, the licensing officer shall notify applicable entities advertising such STR that the business license has been revoked in the period of time associated with such rev revocation. So it actually mandates that we get in touch with Airbnb or VRBO or whoever's advertising these and let them know the business license has been revoked. This is no longer eligible for advertisement. But this is still the city taking the action or taking the, taking the step. From the way that I read the, uh, how Boston and Airbnb are working together now, Airbnb is actually telling the city of Boston, or actually they're just removing the sites or the properties altogether before the city even communicates. So that's why I'm wondering if we're, and maybe I, I just have to go back and look and uh, understand it a little bit better, but it sounded like Airbnb was actually taking the step. Airbnb, there has to be a way for Airbnb to know when a license has been revoked. And the only way is for us to create a database that Airbnb would have access to. And right at the moment, the way this code is written is, um, while while there would be a database available to the police officers, it wouldn't be something searchable, immediately searchable or knowable. So I think it puts the burden on the city to let, to let these entities know. But the other thing is, it, if there isn't a business license, it's not a legal rental. And that goes back to your Boston case. What, what came out of that is if it's not a legal rental, they cannot post it. So without a, legal, a valid business license, um, by that decision, that's done. So our goal is if on Tuesday they have a business license, but on Friday it gets revoked, we don't want to wait around two or three weeks till they figure it out. We need to make sure they know immediately. Yeah. Thank you. Member Question, then what I'm going to ask us to do is to go through each section and ask if there are any amendments, if, we can, if we've got questions, if we're done with most of our questions. You bet. And it's, I think it's uh, building off of uh, Mayor Pro Tem Sierra, and I, I've seen in other cities too, where it's required within a posting that the, the host says license number Inglewood 1234, and then it makes it pretty identifiable that this, and could it be a BS number? Sure, but uh, that's something that can be figured out as well. And so I, I think that, uh, well, is that something we could add? I mean, I would think we could put that requirement in there as well, that, that license number must be posted within listings. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. All right. So I'm going to ask you to stay pretty close because I think some things more might get jogged as we're going through. But what I'd like to do at this point is to start with um, 531.1 or 5-31-1 definitions and ask, are there any amendments to any of the language in this section that you want to direct staff to bring back? Member Russell. Um, why do we need ADUs defined in here unless we're um, allowing them to be used? Or, I mean, maybe we to need to define it, but we need to make it clear that they can't be used if that's what we decide. Correct. This is regulations if it gets passed. But we're talking about amendments and we're going through it here. So I'm addressing it here because it comes up later on. Member Russell? Yes. Um, just for clarification's purposes, it's only ADU is uh, just defined as an accessory dwelling unit. It doesn't say it's legal or not legal, but we do anticipate that you as the council will define it as legal or not legal, and we don't want to argue with people that we used the term ADU and they didn't know what it meant. So this is only definitional, whether or not you permit it or not. Um, that's a separate question. Thank you. So, uh, a great question. So, member, or so, um, city attorney, then if we get down further and there's an amendment to this, then we would just take it out of here. Honestly, I think that if you decide that ADUs are not, are not to be permitted, that you would just add the negative into that sense. I okay. think it needs to be very clear whether they are or not. Excellent. Thank you. Does that help, Member Russell? Yes, thank okay. you. So any, anything else on that? So, we'll, so earmark that one. <laughs> Make sure we don't forget it, Member Russell. Um, no, I don't see anything, so. Uh, uh, Mayor, yeah. you suggested that you would like the definition for bed and breakfast to be integrated yes. into this, so I put that into my notes. All right. Is that agreed upon by everybody? Do we, do we yes, need to fine. bring it back like that? It doesn't mean, okay. Second thing would 5-31-2, uh, 
business uh, license required. If you're on your electronic, that's page 53. Page two of the actual SDR licensing. Ooh, everything lit up. Member Cuesta. Uh, yeah, and I'm sorry, Mayor. I'm still on the, the last one. Okay, the definitions. This is primary residence, and I do still see a very way, a very easy way for folks to violate the primary residence rule, and it is allowing property tax notices or utility bills. Which again, anybody who owns a home will pay both of those. Those would be easy to have in your name. Um, I don't see how you wouldn't have those in your name. And I'm not sure if it's striking those two. Now I realize that that puts it much more limited on the other uh, documents you can provide. But I think as of right now. Anybody can prove primary residency, regardless regardless of where you live um, on Earth. Thank you. Are others concerned about that same thing? And would you see something you would want to add in to make it a little stronger, and that you'd want to do an amendment? Member Russell first, and then I'll go to. I absolutely agree with Council Member Cuesta. Um, I mean, even in owning rental property. Um, we always made sure that we got the utility bill because I wanted to make sure the utility bill was getting paid. So I, I believe, I agree with Council Member Cuesta that we should remove those. Can you think of something you'd want to add into it? If not, that's fine. Just come back. Mayor Pro Tem? I have the same concern as Mayor, or sorry, of uh, <laughs> Member, Member Cuesta. <laughs> It's getting late already. It's no, I had that similar concern. I'm just kind of concerned about what the what the language would be. Um, I did a little bit of digging the, uh, previously on this. I think Demer has the same definition as well. Um, but I'm also wondering the fact that we, I, I got to go back and say what we agreed to initially, whether it was owner-occupied or primary residence, and wonder if that has a little bit more teeth. Uh, but I, I am concerned about uh, being able to not actually be a primary residence or what the what we're trying to pass here and, and people taking advantage of that. So, uh, Madam Attorney, would owner-occupied be a stronger term than primary residence? It could be. The other thing uh, that the city manager and I were discussing here is um, we understood that there's going to be, in addition, an affidavit of primary residence, and that's what Denver, we took that from Denver, that's what Denver links into this definition. So not only do we need to see these documents, but they sign something. And whenever you see someone being prosecuted in Denver, they're prosecuted because they signed this affidavit, and then, in fact, they did live in Oregon or somewhere else. So we anticipate that's there, and I've just made a note to make sure that um, somewhere in here, it's not just our expectation, but that we actually include that part of the operating permit requires affidavit, signing an affidavit of primary residence. Would that be an agreement amongst everyone that that, I mean, I also thought that was supposed to be in this, but I thought it was in another place, but I don't think it is, so, or it is, it's later. I have a question. Uh, Member Stone? Um, so how does Denver prove that they perjured themselves on that affidavit? Oh, I can only tell you the cases I read about in the newspaper, which I'm sure are the same ones you read, that something came through. Uh, for instance, uh, they were paying property tax with their new spouse on one property, and yet they've got an affidavit on another. But some kind of documentation comes through that makes it clear that they're, in fact, not living there. It, nothing is going to get to the element of the primary owner decides to go spend the night with his brother uh, in Denver one night while he's renting it out. We won't know about those situations. That's just reality. But if they decide to move in with their new spouse in Denver, there may be documentation that, that will pop up where their voter registration changes to, that kind of thing. So would it be um, practical or useful for us to add provisions that go further to define what that, what, what evidence of primary residence constitutes, such as voter registration, federal income tax uh, returns, stuff like that, that shows evidence that they are in fact identifying that as their primary residence, not just for the purposes of an STR license, but across the board. Certainly, if you would like to change what the documentation is that shows that proves primary residence, you can, you can direct staff to make those changes. Okay, Member Anderson. 
I share um, Member Quest's concern on this, and I think it could be as simple as just removing either property tax notices or utility bill, one or the other, wh wh whatever. You guys, you know, if we if we could agree to direct staff, I think that would be helpful, because this way we can prevent somebody on the front end mm -hmm. from submitting a property tax notice and utility bill. It, li they're lying about it, right? But they they can get those documents sent to that house and they can be doing it illegal from day one. Now, I don't think we can prevent somebody from changing their primary residence um, and, 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 and then having, you know, committed fraud later on and then, you know, we, we can, I don't think we can prevent that, but I think we can refine this a little bit to actually prevent it on the front end. And I think that's a good suggestion from Member Cuesta. Thank you. I was not paying attention that it was 6.30 and past. It's 10 to 7. I'm, I'm thinking that we just need to keep moving on this and, and finish this tonight regardless. Are you, I mean, we can check in again at 7.30, but are we okay with that to keep moving? Anybody? I'll let you, I'll push those off. Anybody want to say no to that? Okay. All right, next is member Cuesta. I just, Russell? I have a point of information on what um, member Anderson just shared that if they own it and then they decide to change their primary residence, there's nothing we can do. That's not true, is it? Because if our law states that it has to be their primary residence, if they change, then they have to surrender mm -hmm. their license. Yeah, I was just saying that if we, that, that we can't, we won't particularly know that. They could still be lying to us later on, but at least if, you know, and hopefully we would figure that out and, you know, come, you know, enforce that fraud against them or whatever. But, yeah, I think you're right, yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, so Member Cuesta is next, and then again, Member and Russell. I don't have air language or tight language to suggest in place of this right now, but the way I'm reading it, primary residence means a residence, uh, which is the usual place of return for housing, is documented by at least two of the following documents. Where the way we've written it, as long as you can produce these two documents, um, you'll, you'll meet that threshold, even by affidavit, that you can sign these affidavit that I've got these two documents. And I think tightening that up would be good. I like the idea of the tax returns. I think that that's one that's usually primarily filed by, by where you reside. Uh, if somebody can come up with that, be it state or federal, that would go a long way, I think. I almost like that being a requirement. Uh, and then you can have a second supporting one. Um, we can continue to, to hammer that out. But I, I think that there's definitely, uh, there's still some air in that. But it sounds like there's some ideas to resolve that. Thank you. So, Madam Attorney, do we have to have an am amendment made tonight for that? Or can we just direct you to come back with that? Do you have to, would, should we vote on that? All you're doing tonight is directing staff, so we're yeah. taking notes like crazy and, and hope to get something back to you ASAP okay, showing so that we've addressed these issues. So if there's amendment language, we'll make that. But on this kind of stuff, we're just, we're just asking you to come back with more on this. And I think everyone's in agreement with that across the board, right? Okay. All right. Um, Mayor Pro Tem? No, I was going to say, yeah, basically, it's to the same point that there's consensus here that we want more teeth or at least get some more okay, like, stronger language from staff. Member Stone? Do you guys need any further, like, are those suggestions sufficient for tightening up that language, or would you like further specificity? Yeah, I think we have enough to take. All right, Member, oh, Member Wink? This is an overall comment. Thank you, Mayor. I'll be quick. Uh, I think grammatically we need to remove the apostrophes before the lower, the mini school S, after SDRs and ADUs, you can do a find and replace. There's no possession. Just it's a grammar thing. I love it. <laughs> There's no Those apostrophe s necessary. Yeah, <laughs> and it's so you, you can find and replace all and make it easy for SDRs and ADUs. Thank you. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so moving on to five thirty one two dash two. Is that right? Business mm -hmm. license required. Any uh, amendments or suggestions for changes in wording here? And let me let me just say, could we be very brief and try not to give all kinds of nuances in is and then I'm not trying to repeat everybody unless we're trying to get clarity member stone first uh, yeah so um, because with or without meals is included here then part of the business licensing should include uh, for food services so do we have something already in place that does that like with the air with the um Bed and breakfast in the past that we can pull that in. Is that what you're suggesting? Something like that? Yeah. So, I mean, if somebody's serving food in one of these places, I want to make sure that it's safe, clean, and not going to, you know, send somebody to the hospital. I used to cook, and I know how dangerous it can be. So. 
probably, yeah, let's hear from some of those who, uh, Manager Lewis. Mayor Olson, I am not familiar with any such regulation um, similar to that in other cities. We can certainly do some research. I think that would be very, very difficult to do. And it would be similar to when you invite your friends over to have dinner. The city is not involved with the health and safety of that. I realize this is different from that, but at the same time, it would be almost the same regulatory process as you know, having someone over to your house and trying to regulate that. But we can certainly look at it if a majority of council would like. So I don't, I don't feel that it's the same as having someone over to your house because it is in fact a business and because we're requiring business licenses, I think that we need to require the same business inspections as anyone else who would be operating a business that performs those services. Um, and because we are making B&B &B synonymous with STR, then that means that any STR can serve food and therefore should be under the same regulations as any other facility that serves food professionally for a profit. Point of information, in Mayor. Go ahead. Uh, I feel as if what I'm hearing is that we're requiring restaurant license level licensing, which seems to be going a little extreme for this so scenario. Is there anybody else that wants to speak to the yeah, that, uh, member Anderson? Let's just keep it It's going. not a concern that I, I don't share that one with. Council Member Stone, I don't know if others do, but I just wanted to get that out. Any, anybody I would like to weigh in. Mayor, uh, Member Russell, and then Member um, Costa. Thank you. Um, I agree with uh, Council Member Stone, and I think that's what I see as problematic in um, including um, bed and breakfasts in with short-term rentals. Even though they're similar, they're somewhat different. Bed and breakfasts um, are offering a meal, and... I really don't believe that should be the goal of our short-term rental ordinance. I don't believe we should allow meals in our short-term rentals. Amber Quest. Pardon me if we've discussed this. Did a bed and breakfast license require an additional food license of some sort? So um, the bed and breakfast, they require a license from the state, but they don't require um, any sort of food safety license if they're just doing like a one-night guest overnight food preparation, they don't require anything at the state level. It's when you get to, um, you know, serving, you know, the neighborhood and things like that, that's when, that's when those standards kick in. So at least as it stands now, Inglewood, there may be a state license, um, but not a local, or, or you're saying there's... there's right, there, I don't believe there's, there's a state license, but there's nothing local, I don't believe. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem? I was going to say, if, if there is a concern about that, it almost makes sense for us to split the two. It almost sounds like we would have to revise the ordinance for bed and breakfast separately if there's ongoing concern about the food safety aspect of it. Amber Stone? Um, so is there anything in the current definitions of B&B &B that says a certain amount of time? Because you just suggested somebody staying overnight, eating there once, uh, because the SDR legislation that is currently in front of us defines it as less than 30 days, right? So again, I feel like there's a, a discernible and, and definable difference between the, and I'm not going to call it a definition, but the, the example that you gave of a bed and breakfast versus the, the short-term rentals that we're proposing right now. Because that could conceivably be 29 days of meals served. Sure. And, uh, you know, separating it out, um, Again, that's up to you, that, but that might be a good idea. Uh, oftentimes, bed and breakfast, the definition of explicitly states the preparation of food and the definition of those. Um, and also, you can get into different situations with, with bed and breakfasts um, where you, have, you are renting multiple rooms to, under different contracts and preparing a larger meal for different people. So there is some... Um, Discussion. I have an idea for this. Uh, it seems to me the intent with planning and zoning was to just call out the fact that B and Bs have been getting by with being short-term rentals all this time, mm -hmm. and that what they wanted to be pulled back into is primary residence. If we're going to go this route, everybody's considered that. Perhaps B and B becomes a subset within short-term rentals that we then decide if there's some clarity around, if they're gonna offer on our website that they give food and that they give breakfast, that we come up with something that makes everyone feel comfortable with the food preparation or whatever, which is probably comply with, comply with state. So it'd be a sub subset of it. That's acceptable to me, yeah. I don't know if that's doable or not. Well, <laughs> I think I'm making you, like almost everything's giving doable. you a headache over there. 
I don't know. The problem here is a lot of bed and breakfast lets you get up and pour your own bowl of Cheerios. Um, or maybe someone says, do you want toast and a pot of tea? So I don't know exactly if we know what we're regulating, and it's someone's kitchen. No. That's the other thing is if everybody knows that the health inspector, and we don't have a local health inspector, so it'd have to be at the county level. Local health inspector came out on January 1 and made sure on that day you'd cleaned your kitchen and washed your dishes well. I, I don't, the enforcement at this level in someone's home is right at the moment difficult for me to comprehend. If council directs that we find some way to do this, we will find some way to do this, but I can tell you I will need more than two days to bring something back on this. Uh, are we in agreement that we want bread and breakfast sort of come into this whole Can, can we weigh in? Yeah, I, that's what I'm asking about. Okay, so I have, I still have a problem with including it. If the goal of P and Z was to avoid these um, um, subset group that were operating short-term rentals under Airbnb, it's gonna be fixed with anyway with the licensing of short-term rentals. And so if they're in Airbnb, they will still be able to operate without doing it. That's why I really don't want to see including our, our bed and breakfast in here. You don't think it matters either way? No, yeah. I do Member Cuesta. It muddied the water for me a bit when it came back uh, with that included. Now, I appreciate the background on, on the intents behind it, but um, I, if we pull it, I, I, it simplifies it a little bit for me is my perspective. Thank you. This is where it would have to be pulled, right? Member Anderson. I, I think it makes a lot of sense to include short-term rentals in with, or include B&Bs in with short-term rentals. And I don't think we need to be regulating the, the, the small meals that these are going to be providing. I, I, I'm, I mean, maybe we need to go down the line and see where we land on this thing, but I don't, I don't support it. Mayor Pro Tem. <clears throat> of the five uh, recommendations that came back from P&Z, that was the one that gave me the least amount of heartburn. So to me, it could be uh, either in or out. I don't care one way or another. Member Wink. I don't mind either way either. Um, it, let's leave it in B&Bs with SDRs. I, I felt the uh, same way, so I think we have a consensus of four. I'm not worried about the food piece of it. I think that's, and if we, uh, the nice thing about moving all this into uh, Title IV is that we're gonna have regulation, if uh, uh, a, a quickness that we can respond to things as they come up. Uh, so I, I'd like to leave it where it is for now. On to, so we are, are we okay with that? And then we've, we're on to business licensing required. Was there, was there anything there? And I, I'm sorry if I uh, checked your light off, so put it back <laughs> up if I missed something. Mayor Pro Tem? Yeah, for uh, C under 531.2, I would like to add some type of language that would allow for multiple contracts if raining out rooms. Um, I'll leave that at that. Boy, my, I'm missing a page three, that's why. Okay, I gotta look in here. Would you repeat what you just said? So it, I, I believe it would fall under 531-2C, and it begins a business license issue for short-term rentals. There is a, I, I believe the second sentence states, oh. a property may not be under more than one rental agreement for any fixed dates and time. So that to me, this would be the place where we would add a provision that would allow multiple contracts if you're renting out rooms. And if I'm incorrect, please let me know. Okay, that's great. Member Stone? Um, yeah, I believe this is also the part that talks about, yeah, the application process. So I would like to see an initial inspection of the property to make sure that it's, uh, you know, a viable STR location prior to issuing a permit so that we're being proactive, not reactive. Can we take well, one at a time, property under more than one rental agreement. Anybody else want to? I support that. I support. Member Cuesta. Uh, and we're currently discussing more than one contract, correct? Is what yes. We're with. I'm a no. Uh, I think that the, the point made by staff where we're really trying to prevent essentially a hotel operating next to um, residences uh, is the goal here. I understand you could say, well, is it slightly a hotel? We're still allowing one person in there. What's the difference between one and, and four different contracts? I, I'd prefer to stay away from that. I won't support it. Thank you. Member Russell. 
Um, I would prefer to stay away from that as well because it does open the door for situations like we already have had in the city where there's problems with differing people um, staying in the same property um, that is under a different contract. So um, I think it's not wise to do that. Member Stone? I'd be open to a compromise splitting the two arguments. Meaning? Uh, I'd be open to allowing two contracts maximum per STR. I like it. Yeah. With the same number of maximum occupants per room and the same number of maximum op occupants per STR as a whole. Member Anderson? I, yeah, I, okay. I can support that. Mayor Pro Tem? Um, well, I want to add a little bit of clarity to my initial point. I wanted to make sure that when we were, if you're renting out rooms, you can't rent out the larger property overall. So obviously there was one or the other. So you're saying just two contracts, two rooms. So I'm saying two contracts per STR. So obviously if you've got an STR, let's, let's I'll give you a real life example. Uh, one of the STRs that I personally looked at, the uh, owner occupant uh, occupies the basement. Um, she's got kind of a, a full setup down there and then she's got two rooms upstairs that she rents out. And generally what she does is she rents the entire top floor as a single uh, rental, but she's got two bedrooms. So my thinking there is she can either rent out the entire place, the two bedrooms and the kitchen and all that as a single contract, or if she so desired, she could rent out each of those bedrooms as two contracts maximum um, with a maximum of two occupants per bedroom. So she can rent out four occupants on a single contract in those two bedrooms or four occupants, two per bedroom on two separate contracts. Does that make sense? Or. You said yep. or, right? Right. So maximum two contracts, keeping the same maximum number of people per bedroom. Did staff understand that? Because it still prevents the, you know, neighborhood motel. They got it. They've got but, it. Yeah. Member Anderson? No, I don't. Okay. I think it's clear. I would be in agreement with that. I, I don't, I actually, the, the eight kind of yeah. scarred me at first. I'd rather just say, you know, two, two contracts. Yeah, well, you could do a whole basement and have eight, I guess, too. That'd be one contract. So probably have to have a limit on it. Yeah. I'm fine with this coming in that way. Mayor Pro Tem. Can I just add a comment here, just because I'm not sure how the rest of the discussion tonight's going to go, but can we maybe circle back to this, just depending on what we state about ADUs? Sure. Because I'm not sure if that. Yep, bring it up when we get there. Okay. All right, anything else on that, that section? 5-31-2. Okay, moving on to 5-31-3. Member Wink. Thank you, Mayor. Um, 8B. Um, shall we clarify that language to say within 10 business days? It says 10 days right now. Uh, yeah. 531, 5 31 3. Um, uh, oh, I beg your pardon. Wait, right? No, you got it. 5 3. Yeah, it's there, B. 10, it's down way to the bottom of that first paragraph. Thank you. I actually like it to be 10 days because I don't care how, it's a business every day for a short term rental. It's right. not one or the other. I think the shorter that we can make this, the better. We want to know exactly what's going on. I wanted on. us to be concise. Since in other places we mentioned like the five business days for the change of contact person, I just wanted to be concise. So if it's calendar days, maybe say calendar days. Point of information. Okay. It, at one point in time when we were discussing before, days under a certain amount are literal days. Would you explain that to us? The state of Colorado has defined the term day to mean a day unless so otherwise stated. Oh. So there are certain places where we're going with, with five days, and because that's such a short period of time, it would run over a weekend, we did uh, clarify to say five business days. But if it's more than, than five days, we, we just left it at straight 10 days because if anybody were to to contest this, Colorado law has already defined it. Thank you. Amber Wink, did you have something more? I do, Mayor. Um, we discussed it earlier when I wasn't supposed to have, I just want to be sure that staff has the language for, um, shall be posted on the inside of all points of ingress slash egress instead of conspicuously. 
Okay. So um, <laughs> I'd, I'd like to suggest on this one that a door may not be always the best place, but somewhere else might even be better. Uh, so I don't know what that might be. And but I would like to make, in that case, it almost like it to be twice, once on the door and somewhere else, like on the mirror. No. And you know, Mayor, uh, is it necessary for us to accommodate uh, s visual differences? And I mean, does it need to be in Braille? The ADA thing. Mm -hmm. If we just put it in English language, in English and in black and white, is that enough? <laughs> could we uh could yeah go ahead yes yes it's fine uh, the the standards for meeting ada or the standards for making sure that if you're going to be renting to people who only speak uh german that you would have it understandable to them that's on the property owner oh. member cuesta you. This might be getting too granular at this point, but under the affidavit component, it seems like Denver has done a good job with kind of spooking people away by saying this is under the penalty of perjury. I think they've charged some people with felonies. Uh, it, when we draw up that form, I think including language as such uh, would be helpful. So people are fully aware they are asserting uh, under the penalty of uh, perjury that, that they're telling the truth on that. And I'm not sure if that needs to go into code, but it, even if it's when we draft the forms, I think that, that would be valuable language to include. Thank you. Great. Anything, uh, Member Stone? Yeah, I'd like to circle back to the first thing that I had suggested, which was an initial inspection. Yes, and where is that under here? There is no initial there inspection. Is no initial. There, so, there is. Right. I thought there was. Inspection, and that was a misstatement on someone's yeah. part. It's part of the operating permit. Yeah. So this, is, this kind of runs backwards. It's a three-tier process. Step one is the property owner has to get an operating permit, and that includes the life safety inspection. Uh, and all those inspections. Once they get the operating permit, then they're allowed to go f uh, register their STR with the community development. Once they've registered with community development, then they're allowed to go apply for a business license. They're not allowed to post uh, on any website until they have a business license. So there is that initial inspection, and it is an annual inspection. Okay, perfect. That solves everything for me. Thank you. Great. Can we move on from 5313 to 5314 then? Member Anderson. I think this is where <coughs> ADUs come up. And You're I, still on dash three? No, I'm on four. Okay, great. Yep. So we're on um, four? This is where ADUs come up, and I, I support including ADUs as the recommended from PNZ. I think it's a great way to um, <coughs> allow homeowners to um, keep their housing affordable by renting out an EU. They're right there on the property, so I don't think we get problems with um, with the kinds of things, the negative impacts of somebody not living on the property. So I, I'm totally supportive of ADUs. Okay, Member Wink. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I support ADUs as well, and then I wanted to just comment on um, Section I under 5-31-4. Again, at the proper time, I, I want to ensure that we include providing the number of parking spaces and the locations of them. I think to reiterate where those spaces are such that we're not interrupting neighbors' access to parking. Could you hold us on that one and let's go back to um, and make sure we cover it again, but ADUs, I wanna hear what people say. So mm. we, we, we're gonna need to make an amendment on this or accept it as it is is what, it, what we're being heard. Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah, I was just going to say, so regarding ADUs, I won't be supporting uh, allowing ADUs as short-term rentals. Um, so I just wanted to make it clear that that's where I stood. All right, others? Member Cuesta. I will not be as well. When we had this conversation, it feels like a while ago. It wasn't that long ago. Fundamentally, we said STRs would not be built into that. Now, to uh, Member Anderson and Member Stone's credit, they were not here at the time, so they're certainly not beholden to that conversation or decision made, but that was really a, com a major component of it, is that these would not be allowed for STRs, so I won't be supporting either. Thank you. Member Russell. I will not be supporting ADUs either, and I do believe that um, it was a major component, even back when we were discussing ADUs, so thank you. Member Wink. Thank you, Member Cuesta. I, I, I hate to say it, but I forgot that. Um, even though it was such a big, deep discussion, but I think you're absolutely right. Now it, you know, it comes back to my memory, us talking about using ADUs for that purpose. Not to say we can't revisit, but I do remember that. 
Member Stone. Um, so I appreciate uh, Member Cuesta letting me off the hook on this part. Um, but I would, maybe this is a little abnormal, but I'd like to ask if I could get the the reasoning for that because I haven't actually made up my mind one way or the other and I would like to hear from my fellow council members as to why that was decided in that initial conversation to kind of help me make my decision if that's okay. Mayor Pro Tem has. Yeah, I can state my reasoning. So when I when ADUs did come up, I saw it as a way to provide uh, affordable housing to uh, a portion of society. So what we're doing here, or at least the way that I'm seeing this, is that we're not precluding anybody from using their ADUs as a long-term rental. Mm -hmm. But I do believe that, you know, just taking away that short-term rental ability, uh, to me, would increase the rental stock within the city. So that's my reasoning behind it. Gotcha. So I also was a part of that and said ADUs, uh, I allowed, wanted to allow ADUs, and uh, be, we weren't talking about short-term rentals at the time, but I mean, we were not trying to link them, but we did talk about it. I have done a lot more research since then, and I hope <laughs> Member Cuesta can allow for us to change our mind over time. I've been mostly talking to people around issues of homelessness and affordability, and I've been a bit more convinced that ADUs actually allow for some of our people to stay also in place and pay for their place. So I'm a little bit more um, open to them than I have been in the past as being a possibility, uh, probably for the same reason that you see. Uh, but it was largely because we didn't want to, I mean, we were hoping that people would age in place and stay there or have a, a son or daughter move in or something. That That's really what's allowing for affordability. Um, but I realized, it, and I think that in the planning and zoning meeting, you heard them talk about it's really just one tool in the, in the toolbox for um, affordability and realizing the reverse affordability is a little bit more complicated than I let it be. But member Anderson and then Member Cuesta. I am, um, yeah, I, I've studied this quite a bit. And what I think what, you, what we've seen in some places around the country is that ADUs provide a lot of relief to the homeowners um, once they have the ADUs on the property. And this is a, a, a way to allow ADUs to get built. Do we know how many, how many permits have been pulled for ADUs since we passed that law? One. One. My, my contention here is this, the, we, we need more affordable housing. If this allows somebody to say, hey, I can build an ADU, I can rent it out as a short-term rental and pay it off in a shorter time frame. And now it's economically feasible for that person to, to get it built. They may not want to keep an ADU as an, a short-term rental forever. In fact, I don't, think, I, don't, I don't think a lot of people want to, they don't want to be managing a short-term rental on their property for the rest of their life. But it allows it to get built and then they can, you know, they can keep it around for their parents to age in place. Or I think you, you get both options here on the table. That's why I'm supporting it is because I think this changes the economics of building one, which helps out in the long run with affordable housing. Member Cuesta. You bet. In full disclosure, I did not support ADUs too. But the most compelling stories we heard there, it was the aging parent. It's the kid that's come back from college and can't afford a, a place in Denver because it's so expensive anymore. And we do have the relief built in, I think, with long-term rental. You can certainly still recover your, um, your investment on that. So I, I think that there are certain places or reasons for people to recoup. I mean, even if it's included in STR, if they're allowed as STRs, do I think we're going to see a, a tidal wave of, of permits pulled on ADUs tomorrow? Probably not. And I'm sorry, it's one that's been pulled so far and it's been six months. How long has it been? A year. A year. So I, it, this probably isn't that great of an impact on new ones. For me, it's the existing ADUs. And how many existing ADUs do we have within the city? A hundred and, a hundred and I want to say 80 some. Not, and, and that's more where it falls for me. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Member Russell. Um, when you say that only one permit has been pulled for an ADU, can you not pull a permit for an ADU until your primary residence is compliant with a code? That's, that's correct. You must have a compliant primary residence. So how many people are having their primary residence evaluated for code in the anticipation of building an ADU? As far as I know, one. Okay, the one that the one that we're talking about, and thank you, I appreciate that information. Um, the problem that I see is in putting ADUs in here. Short-term rent rentals are neither affordable 
nor do they promote affordability for other people. Um, the people who rent short-term rentals are paying a lot more money than they would for, and so by uh, allowing ADUs to be used for, um, <clears throat> to be used for short-term rentals, you are eliminating the purpose for which we created ADUs in the first place. Um, we will get developers coming in here, buying up all the properties.